Today on Categorical Imperatives, we are going to be doing what I am going to represent as answering fan mail, because that sounds way cooler and makes me sound way more popular than if I just said I'm doing a response video on presidential election related topics. So let's get to the fan mail. Hey, greetings. Welcome back once again to Categorical Imperatives. As always, I am your host, Locking Liberal, and I do want to thank you all so much for joining me here today. Now, if you are new to this program, I would especially like to welcome you. This is a podcast where we're going to be using legal theory and moral philosophy to discuss current events in law, politics, and culture. Now, I recently received uh, a very uh, interesting uh, comment uh, from a guy who was giving me some really interesting feedback on an old episode that I had make uh, talking about the underlying philosophy of American constitutional republicanism. And I was discussing how it related to a number of other topics. Uh, he was, excuse me, he was discussing how it related to a number of other topics that were of interest to him. Uh, and he kind of talked about them. Uh, and he asked me if I would do a follow-up video discussing those related topics and whether or not I agreed with his conclusions. So that is what we're going to be doing here today. Now, he also uh, sent me a very uh, interesting article. Uh, and uh, he has a Facebook group where he posts articles. Uh, so it seems like a really interesting group. And... Here's the article. I have it linked down below, uh, so go check that out. And I also just have a link to the Facebook page. Uh, I, I don't have a Facebook account myself, but if you do, I would recommend going over there. Uh, send him a request to join the group and check his stuff out, because like I said, he does seem uh, like a really interesting guy. It uh, seems like he's got some really good content over there. So, if you think I do interesting videos as well, uh, here on YouTube, you should consider subscribing to the channel. Uh, you know, leave me a thumbs up or thumbs down to let me know what you thought of the video. And if you have any comments, I would love to hear them. Uh, and, and seriously, if you have any show ideas or suggestions or questions, uh, some of my best videos I have ever done have been suggestions uh, from viewers in my video comments. Uh, I think this series I'm going to be doing on this guy's uh, uh, comments are going to be really good as well, so I really love getting these. Of course, you can also check the description to find links to other great places to find me. Uh, I back up the show over on odyssey.com. I post an audio-only version on places like Anchor and Spotify, uh, and I publish articles as well, not only over on Substack, but I am a regular contributor of articles to places such as the Libertarian Institute and the Tenth Amendment Center, so you can find links to all of those down below. And of course, if you want to support the channel by becoming a patron over on Patreon or leaving me a little tip over on PayPal, you can do that as well. Uh, if you can't chip in right now, that's all right. I totally understand. I still very much appreciate you giving me some of your time today. All the same. And that goes for whether you're a, a longtime viewer or a first time viewer, I guess. Um, so. We're going to be going over uh, the information uh, that he had sent me, and it's really uh, it's going to start with something of his own take on the information I had in the video. Uh, and he, as I said, he left a comment on that video that posed a few uh, of his own views uh, that he felt in one way or another were related to uh, what I was discussing in my video. Uh, he was also kind enough uh, to follow up when I asked him for some more information about these topics, uh, he sent me a very detailed email and he sent me some citations I asked him uh, to send and he was good enough to give me all of that. So uh, I wanted to thank him for putting in that extra effort uh, and I wanted to let you guys know that uh, there is some good follow-up information. Uh, I will be including links to the several articles he sent to me that speak uh, to the topics we will be discussing. Uh, and 
uh, let's see here. His comment, article, and email uh, sort of combined. Uh, really, they touched on a number of different topics that for a kind of simplicity and ease, uh, I have broken down into three rough categories because I want to cover these separately. So today we are going to be talking about aspects of the Electoral College. Uh, the next video that will be out in a day or two will be on the Appointments Clause of the Constitution. And the third and final video will be covering a subject that I have actually seriously wanted a good chance to talk about ever since I started doing these videos. And so now I am very excited that I'm going to be able to do that. And I'm going to be talking about the differences between private and public corporations and talking about many of the myths and misconceptions about these two very different sorts of legal entities. But I genuinely think all three videos, uh, and I've scripted all of them at this point, so I have some idea. I think they're all going to be very interesting. I know I found it incredibly interesting to uh, check out the material he sent me, and I very much enjoyed uh, making these response videos. So I hope you guys find this all as interesting as I do. So first, let's. Uh, I, I'm going to go to the uh, the section of the email and the comment that he sent me that was talking about the electoral college, and we're going to go over the basic information on that together. So he starts out saying that uh, the first thing that I ever found was probably the most important. He says, when you vote for a presidential candidate, you are actually voting for a candidate's preferred electors. And here he included an article, uh, this one here. Uh, so I will have that link down below. So if you want to see specifically what he's talking about, uh, you can go check that out. He goes on to say that in 2020, uh, the courts said that these electors must be 100% party loyalists and states can fine electors for going off course. And this is a research paper that he sent me uh, to uh, sort of back up and elaborate on this claim. You can also find that link below. And then he says, uh, this is just one of many articles that you can pull up using the phrase electors rule in redistricting. He is talking about this article right here that is also, as I said, with everything else linked below. And he goes on to say that there is a 15-member advisory committee uh, that is composed of residents and electors of the county and is tasked with revising the latest census data and submitting a proposed redistricting plan for the county commission districts for the BCC's consideration. Uh, and if you're having trouble following this, go pull up that article on redistricting uh, that he sent me and maybe take a moment and read that first on your own or read it through with me as kind of I'm talking about it here. Uh, that will give you a better idea. So, he goes on to say, so in other words, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, uh, but the party not only selects their spokesperson, but by winning said seat in the White House, they can then control local districts account across the county. He says it seems jacked up to me, and there's plenty to go and read on that, but I think the scariest thing I learned was that weighted voting was never abolished, and a lot of states, maybe them all, still use the process. The whole thing is how the two-party democracy is controlling local voting as long as they keep the seat in the White House. I would love to know something different, but this is what the documents tell me. And he goes on to say that the last part of my research, getting here was one question. If the power of the president is really just a puppet for the party that selected him, why does every single medium of information focus on that seat? gerrymandering, redistricting, and weighted voting. That's why. That seat actually dictates how local city votes are actually counted. Maybe you can address that in a future broadcast. Either way, agree or not, prove me right or wrong. So, 
I, I, I want to start out by saying that uh, on, on a personal level, I, I completely understand where he's coming from. Uh, anyone who has followed me for a while uh, probably knows that, politically speaking, I am a libertarian. Uh, and I would love a system where the Libertarian Party, and even where other third parties like the Green Party, uh, didn't have things so stacked against them. But the fact is, there really was no reason that a two-party system was seen as either desirable or inevitable until things began to be put into practice. Now, it's obviously not always been the Democrats and Republicans. Uh, when we first kind of got founded, we found the Federalists and Anti-Federalists. And then the Anti-Federalists sort of became the Democratic Republicans. So we had Federalists and Democratic Republicans. Uh, and then it, the Federalists sort of waned out and we had the Democratic Republicans and Whigs. Uh, then the Democratic Republicans had to die out and we had the, Democrat the Democrats and the Whigs. And it wasn't until the mid-19th century that we have Democrats and Republicans. So while our system isn't permanently stuck with the same two parties, there does seem to be something of an organic two-party system here that is almost inevitable, I think. Now, that's not to say there is no room for reform within a two-party framework. So if anyone, and actually, yeah, if anyone wants to understand how our modern political system keeps these two parties, Democrat and Republican, in control, I highly suggest reading uh, Ralph Nader's book, Crashing the Party. It's his memoirs from the 2000 election when he really got significantly closer than any other third party candidate in my lifetime to being a real viable option. Now, keep in mind, it's not that he got anywhere near actually having winnable numbers. He just got enough votes so that the Democrats could pretend all his voters were Democrats and that Ralph Nader had cost them the election because his vote total ended up beating the spread between Bush and Gore. However, the spoiler effect is demonstrably untrue. Polling data from that election shows a nearly 50-50 split between people who were otherwise Democrats and people who were otherwise Republicans voting for Nader. Now, I do have a suggestion of what we can do to return power to the people in our presidential elections, but first I need to spend some time addressing some of the other interesting points he brings up here before I can really get into that. Now, to go back to the first two points in his letter real quick. When you vote for a presidential candidate, you are actually voting for your candidate's preferred electors. And in 2020, the court said that the electors must be 100% party loyalists and state can find electors for going off course. Now, I don't really understand how point one and point two can both be seen as fundamentally negative when a particular candidate wins in a given state would you be okay with those electors uh, who were supposed to vote for a particular candidate casting their electoral votes for anyone except the person who you voted for and who won the election you know what i mean also the other thing that I will say is, however you feel um, about faithless electors, there's a lot of different opinions about them, but I, I thought it would be worth pointing out that faithless electors are not some new phenomenon that just suddenly appeared out of nowhere in 2020. And this is because it is left up to each state to create the rules and procedures governing presidential elections in that state. Now, some states have allowed faithless electors, and some have not. The Constitution plainly makes such rules and procedures a plenary power of the several states. All that happened in that uh, the Supreme Court cases, I believe that the big case was uh, Schiaffalo v. Washington was, was the big elector case. Uh, and all the Supreme Court did was confirm what many states had already been doing for a very, very long time, 
by making sure that electors vote for the candidate that they are slated to vote for. And they, the Supreme Court just said that this practice uh, of not allowing faithless electors is not in any way at odds with the electors clause of Article 2, Section 1, Clause 2, or the 12th Amendment. Uh, and those are the places that dictate uh, the presidential voting. So from whence precisely does this plenary power come, I hear you asking? Well, I just told you, but we'll go over it again together. Uh, that would be the presidential electors clause. And that says, quote, the president shall, together with the vice president, chosen for the same term, be elected as follows. Each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors equal to the whole number of senators and representatives to which the state may be entitled in the Congress, but no senator or representative or person holding an office of trust or profit under the United States shall be an appoint shall be appointed an elector. Now, at this point, I want to point out two videos I've done in the past. I've done one, two videos on the Electoral College, and these will come in handy uh, to get an understanding of where all this comes together. So I'm going to spend a little less time on this point than on the other ones, uh, but the videos uh, that I've made about the Electoral College, go into all kinds of details about the origin of the Electors Clause, about the Twelfth Amendment, and about the history of the Electoral College. So, uh, as to his last point about the Advisory Committee for Redistricting, uh, let's go back and read that again once more, actually. So he says, uh, this is just one of many articles that you can pull up using the phrase electors role in redistricting, that there is a 15-member advisory committee composed of residents and electors of the county and is tasked with reviewing the latest census data and submitting proposed restrictions, uh, restrict redistricting plans for the county commission districts in the BCC's consideration. So in other words, tell me if I'm wrong, the party not only selects spokesmen, but by winning said seat in the White House, they can then control local districts across the country. Seems jacked up, and there's plenty to go and read on that, but I think the scariest thing I learned was that weighted voting was never abolished, and a lot of states still use the process. Uh, and he says, the whole thing is how the two-party democracy is controlling local votes as long as they keep their seat in the White House. I would love to know something different, but that's what the documents tell me. Well, he said, tell me if I'm wrong, so I will say this plainly. You're wrong. Presidential elections and local county redistricting have absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with each other. Now, the article that you are citing, uh, yeah, the article that you are citing here, uh, is very clear that county redistricting is governed by county charters. It's clear that state redistricting is governed by the state constitution, which in this particular article happens to be talking about the Florida Constitution specifically. And it is very clear that the U.S. Constitution governs federal redistricting. There is no government jurisdiction, be it municipal, county, state, or federal, that has any ability to affect the redistricting of any other jurisdiction other than the one to which it belongs. Now, I think the big mistake is uh, you are assuming the term electors means the same thing in any and every possible context that the electors who cast votes for the president in the Electoral College uh, are the same thing as local electors, but this isn't so. The presidential electors in the Electoral College exist solely to act as electors in that one particular presidential election. That is their one and only duty. That's it. 
and again, uh, the article that you included is very clear that when it uses the term electors, it is referring to the people elected to the 15-member redistricting advisory committee who, as the article says, simply need to be eligible voters living in the county whose redistricting committee they are elected to in purely local elections, where the only people who have a say are local residents of the county choosing people from among themselves to serve their county alone. Now, to return to presidential elections, uh, you uh, talk about the president as being a, a puppet of the party, uh, and then you say a, pretty much a direct quote. You, you wonder why every medium focuses on the presidential election, and you chalk it up to three things, gerrymandering, redistricting, and weighted voting. Now, don't get me wrong. I entirely understand why reasonable and intellig intelligent individuals could reach that conclusion. I've once believed essentially the same thing myself, the same conclusion you've reached here. But uh, again, to speak plainly, I think when you really dig into it, uh, I, I no longer actually think that any part of that assertion is backed up by any evidence whatsoever. Uh, so first of all, to convince me the president is a party puppet, you would need to explain to me, uh, for one thing, how the fuck 2016 happened. The Republican Party hated Trump. And the fact is, he really wasn't much of a Republican, except for his stricter immigration policies. Most of his platform looked an awful lot like the platform of a populist New York Democrat. And while obviously Republican voters loved Trump, everybody in the party hated him. 2016 was the first time that we did not see a single member of the Bush dynasty go full force to back their guy. We didn't see George I, George II, Barbara Bush, Laura Bush, or even Jeb Bush ever even so much as say a single nice thing about Trump, much less endorse him, much less campaign for him. Now, this is something the Bushes always do for the party. The Bushes have been integral to the Republican Party presidential elections going back to pre-World War II with Prescott Bush. We also saw all the powerful neoconservatives who had really been the core of the party since 1911, or not 1911, what am I thinking, since 9-11, good God. Yeah, the neoconservatives who have been the core of the party since 9-11. We saw them all actively denounce Trump and back Hillary. That's what, like, for example, the Lincoln Project was. That was the powerful neoconservatives who were unwilling to take part uh, in that election with the Republicans because they couldn't control the candidate, and instead, the candidate controlled the party. And they were not going to be controlled by a president who was not for the endless war on terror. And to your reasons that the president is focused on, but you feel that votes don't count, uh, you chalk it up to, again, we, uh, gerrymandering, redistricting, and weighted voting. Now, the first issue, which is a pretty minor one, is, is it's worth pointing out that your first two reasons are the same thing. Gerrymandering is nothing except the practice of redistricting to give one party an advantage. Secondly, gerrymandering doesn't affect presidential elections since he is elected on a state-by-state -state basis based on electoral college votes. State and local redistricting has absolutely no connection to how the president is elected at all. None. Where gerrymandering does have an effect is congressional districts. However, while the effect is real, the problem is highly overrated. 
study after study after study after study have shown that while gerrymandering can cause slight shifts in numbers of seats a party gets, it is never enough of a difference to swing the majority of total seats between the two parties. And I am talking not only about studies that look at real-world effects of actual historical examples of gerrymandering, but also studies done by Washington think tanks to try and figure out, theoretically, could gerrymandering be used to swing control between the parties in an election? In the real world, it never really does. In theory, it's possible, but incredibly unlikely for such conditions to happen in a way that would ever be practicable. So I am going to share I'm going to share one example of what I mean uh, and encourage you uh, to go look into it a little further. So this is uh, a 2012 article from Eric McGee. He is a fairly eminent pollster uh, who showed that despite the Democrats' claims in 2020 that the reason they got a majority of total votes in the House of Representatives but ended up with a minority of the share of the seats uh, was because of gerrymandering. Now, his research shows that was simply not possible. No matter how you look at it, the effect of redistricting is a wash. Now, I have a link to that study down in the description, and when you go there, that study links to tons of other great uh, past studies that look at gerrymandering that will show you the same thing time and again. Now, you are more or less correct that the Electoral College is, in some senses, weighted voting. But the only place that weighted voting takes place is in presidential elections. It does not occur in any municipal, county, or state elections, nor does it happen in the federal legislature election, just the presidency. And there is actually a very, very good reason the system functions that way, and I believe a very strong argument for continuing to function that way in the future. Now, I think it is perfectly reasonable that when you look at the system we have, you may find yourself saying that the president is the president of the nation. He should be elected simply by the people of that nation in a popular vote, and the, that the people should choose their president through a one-person, one-vote tally in a national popular vote. Now, the fundamental problem with that is is that the United States is not a nation. The United States was founded as a federated republic, a confederacy of sovereign states that came together to form a union. A nation implies a single unified political society, and when they declared independence, the 13 colonies became 13 sovereign nations in their own right. Now, they did quickly band in together into a confederation, but a confederation is not the same thing as a nation. Now, the first great legal treatise on our Constitution uh, and on our system of constitutional republicanism, uh, it, as well as uh, on a number of other topics, such as the American reframing of British common law, though that's irrelevant to our discussion here today, um, is a treatise from 1803 known as Tucker's Blackstone. Uh, it is a book of marginalia comparing the English common law and constitution with American common law and the American constitution. Now, in Tucker's Blackstone, St. George Tucker distinguishes a national government from a federal republic such as we ourselves share. He says, quote, a national government is a government of the people of a single state or nation united as a community by what is termed the social compact and possessing complete and perfect supremacy over person and things so far as they can be made the lawful object of civil government. A federal government is distinguished from a national government by its being a government of a community of independent and sovereign states united by compact. 
This is why no one ever refers to our country as the United State. So, the reason the Electoral College matters is because, unlike a national popular vote, the Electoral College reflects the federal nature of the United States constitutional system, and it is properly seen as a system, meaning that every part has to be in good working order for the system to be in good working order. Now, furthermore, while we are taught that America is a democracy and that democracy is majority rule, there is really virtually no evidence in law or history that has ever supported or even uh, intended that to be our particular and peculiar view of democracy. What's more, we know democracy takes many forms and majoritarianism is no more valid than any of the other convening views outside direct democracy and majoritarianism. So it's an impediment. Uh, how do we get around it? Well, there are a wide variety of forms. But the fact is, even though we are a democracy, almost no part of our system was actually ever designed to be majoritarian. After all, we don't expect majoritarianism in our juries. We don't expect majoritarianism in state government. Uh, and we don't expect majoritarianism in federal government, except the House. The veto is not majoritarian. A bicameral legislature is not majoritarian. A filibuster is not majoritarian. And if we're being entirely honest, even the House of Representatives isn't majoritarian. The majority doesn't get any say if you want an amendment added to a bill in the House. It is a partisan majority that carries the House. It is essentially the majority of the largest minority that controls. And that ain't majoritarian. So any idea that the House or national popular voting uh, and the concept of one person, one vote, uh, which never existed uh, until the Warren Court invented that doctrine out of thin air, in 1961, in the case of Baker v. Carr, before that, that any of our systems or doctrines are the normal and expected form of democracy, and that that is majoritarianism, to believe that belies the country we live in. It belies the Madisonian Republic as it has always existed. Now, this brings me to a point uh, we will be met mentioning uh, several times, in the, uh, probably in these videos uh, going forward, uh, and that is that in school, when they teach us about checks and balances, it tends to kind of be something like this. The executive branch checks the legislature by exercising a veto power over the legislature, and the legislature keeps the executive in check by overriding vetoes and impeaching officials, and the president is a check on the judiciary in that he nominates the judges, and the judges are a check on the executive because they can review executive orders, and so on and so on. What you almost certainly will never learn in school is that federalism is itself a check on the power of the federal government. After all, the United States didn't create the state governments, the state governments created the federal government. And this is indeed the purpose of the Tenth Amendment, which says that any power not explicitly granted to the federal government in the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, is reserved to the states or the people respectively. So, and so this is important when we talk about the idea of weighted voting, is, is that uh, to get, with, to get rid of weighted voting would be to go to a national popular vote, would mean to become a national government, would mean to get rid of the federalism that is one of our best checks on unbridled government power. Now, this brings me to your ultimate question. 
How do we make elections matter again? How do we take the massive amount of power instilled in the presidency today and give that power back to the people? Well, I got what might sound like some bad news. That's simply not going to happen. However, nor should it happen. The only way to make that happen would be that fundamental change in structure of our government from a federal to a national government where the power would be back in the hands of the people more directly. Uh, and in uh, another part uh, of your letter that you wrote to me, Kurt, uh, you used a fantastic term that I, I didn't quote here in this video. It comes up later, but uh, you talked about what you, what you quite aptly termed mob rule democracy. And that, that is a great, great term. I really like that a lot. And the thing is that a national popular vote would take uh, what is, if we see what we have now as mob rule democracy, it would essentially turn our nation into something of a democratic suicide pact, where the only thing that mattered was the party in power. You would only do more to exacerbate the power of the two parties at, to the detriment of everybody else. Now, what can be done? What can be done is to shrink the government back to its proper scope and constitutional function. De-emphasize the imperial presidency. So, let's take a look real quick at a list of the extensive expressly delegated powers of the president under Article 2. Under the Constitution, in Article 2, the expressly delegated, uh, delegated powers of the president are he may command military forces, convene or adjourn Congress, veto laws, ask his cabinet members to submit their opinions in writing, grant pardons, and select United States ambassadors and federal appointments by and with the advice and consent of the Senate. And that's it. If we return the power of the president to its proper function, it would hardly matter who won. Neither a Democrat nor Republican, properly constrained to their constitutional duties, could do very much for the other party to even get mad at them for. Now, if you want to know uh, what that shrinking of power might look like, uh, I highly suggest you read uh, Judge Andrew Napolitano's book, Suicide Pact. It's an amazing book. He discusses how uh, what I've come to call myself the imperial presidency came to be. Really, most of the trouble came uh, picking up only at the turn of the 20th century with the onset of the progressive era and the appointment uh, and later election of Teddy Roosevelt. And unfortunately, every single president since then, with the singular exception of Calvin Coolidge, possibly our greatest president ever, has grown the scope of their own powers. And then with each new president, they not only inherit the usurped powers of their collective predecessors, they also claim new usurped powers for themselves. Now, this also relates to why I favor keeping the Electoral College, uh, and this is something that we will be dealing with a great bit in my next video, where I'm going to be discussing the areas of your feedback where you're talking about the Appointments Clause. Doing away with federalism and the Electoral College system that it built uh, with federal function in mind would be to drift wholly into a country in which the only thing that mattered is mob rule democracy. And, uh, it, Kurt, you have very correctly seen that there is a huge danger in mob rule democracy due to the continued existence of our federal republic. Uh, you are very much correct on that point, certainly. However, 
to get to that appointments clause video, we'll unfortunately have to wait for another day. Now, I have the script for that show basically written, as well as uh, the third show where we're going to be talking about public corporations. Uh, so the next video will be out in a couple of days. The next video in a couple of days after that, they'll be coming here pretty quick. Um, so, uh, yeah, anyways, you're not going to want to uh, miss it. Thank you so much uh, for the comment. I, I look forward to hearing back from you uh, and uh, getting your feedback on this video, as well as uh, the other information we'll be going over here in the near future. Thank you so much for reaching out to me, Kurt. Uh, thank you for uh, leaving these questions. Thank you for providing me the information and citations you did. I had a really interesting time uh, reading and responding to you. So, this will be turning into, I think, a really interesting series of videos. Uh, and I hope you guys will continue to find them as interesting as I do. So, uh, like I said in the beginning, real quick, I'll remind you once more, uh, if, if you want to uh, check out Kurt, the guy who uh, sent me this article, and you should, uh, he has a great group website over at Facebook. I'll link to that down in the description. I'll link to the article that he wrote in response to my video down in the description. And you can also find links to me where you can find me everywhere uh, from Odyssey, Anchor, uh, 10th Amendment Center, Libertarian Institute, Substack, all that stuff. If you're not subscribed to the channel, maybe consider hitting that subscribe button real quick. Uh, leave me a thumbs up or a thumbs down to let me know whether you loved or hated this video. And if you have any comments, as I've made very clear throughout this video, please leave me a comment. I really love reading your guys' comments, and I really love when you give me interesting material to respond to, especially in those comments. So, I guess all that's left to say is that this has been me, uh, Lockean Liberal, for Categorical Imperatives, talking about the Electoral College, and of course, as always, Delenda S. Catago.